I want to talk a little bit about then the principle of relationships. Uh, actually, we're going to focus on the power of needs because this is where relationships get their, their concepts from. Power of needs. This is so important in, in understanding how to build a strong marriage and a strong relationship. Uh, successful marriages are a result of knowledge, not of love. Love does not keep marriage together. Write that down right now. Love does not keep marriages together. Write it down, please, because you think it does, and it doesn't. It really doesn't. Okay, first of all, let's talk about needs then. I am convinced that needs are the key to a strong relationship with anything. First point to write down. Everything was created to relate to something else. Number two, all relationships are based on needs. How many? All. All. Relationship between your dog and you, the plant and the soil, the sun and the leaf, everything in this building is based on relationships. You and your car have a relationship going on. You treat it right, it treats you right. You do something for it, it does something for you. Everything is based on relationship. You're not a mechanic, but you need the mechanic. When your car breaks down, you go to visit the mechanic. You don't, you're not married to him, you don't love him. But you've got to relate to him based on something. Am I right? You don't sleep with the doctor, at least not all doctors. Some of you all sleep with the doctor, but, you know, but when you're sick, you've got to relate to the doctor. The dentist, you don't like the dentist, but when your teeth start giving you a problem, you've got to go visit this person. In other words, relationships, everything is related based on relationships. And what is, it, what is it? Needs. Needs. Number three, needs dictate the nature of all relationships. In other words, the kind of relationship you develop with something depends on the needs that it meets in your life. And number four, when needs are neglected, relationships are broken. Boy, this is so simple and yet so misunderstood. Anytime there is a break in your relationship with somebody, it's because there was a need that wasn't met or a need that was neglected. So when something is causing stress in any relationship, it's because someone's need is not being met. If you owe somebody money and you don't pay it, it strays the relationship. You take the plant, pull it from the soil, You've broken the, the, the needs. The plant needs the soil. And so you have destruction. And that leads me to the last point here. Relationships are successful when needs are effectively met. So when we talk about developing a home and developing a marriage, developing family, you have to think about the needs of children, the needs of a spouse, the needs of a home, the needs that you have, that the person has, and you've got to work through those needs and try and develop a spirit of knowledge. Everything is based on needs. When you get married to someone, it's because you decided to meet needs. Hopefully get yours met in the process. But there's no guarantee. We can talk about that in a minute. The essence of marriage, therefore, and relationships, is needs. If relationships are based on needs and the essence of marriage is relationship, then the success of your marriage depends on your knowledge of needs. Very important. Let's talk about needs a little bit. And if needs are so critical, then what are needs? First of all, everything was created to function by specific predetermined principles. Whatever exists was created by the manufacturer to function by certain principles. The car you drive, the watch on your hand, the clothes that you bought, in the back on the collar you see, they tell you how to, to wash it, what not to use, you know, don't use hot water. Kind of. In other words, everything that's created by a manufacturer comes with it, built in, principles by which it's supposed to function. The CD player that you buy, the iron, the toaster, the refrigerator, the, and whatever you, check it out, everything. And everything in nature is the same way. Everything that God, the manufacturer of all things, did with creation, they come with needs built in. 
This is very important to understand. I can't stress it enough. Needs are inherent in a product. Matter of fact, the next point is important. The principle of function are called needs. Whatever a thing is created to function by as a principle, that becomes its need. A plant needs soil, right? No. Put it another way. A plant functions when it is in soil. So the function is based on the principle of soil and the plant. So now the principle becomes a need. So the plant doesn't want soil now, it needs soil. God never says, I will create a plant and it shall need soil. He didn't say that. He just created plants to function in soil. <laughs> so the principle becomes plant relate to soil, plant live. Plant not relate to soil, plant die. So now the function principle is soil. So when you give plants soil, plant functions. So plants need is soil. Water, nutrients, whatever else you want to add there. That means <laughs> every human being in this room created by God, you came with needs that are regulators of your function. In other words, if you want a human to function, you've got to meet certain needs in the human's life. And when the human does not have those needs met, the human starts to malfunction. Hmm. Let me tell you something. When a wife and a husband is having problems, they don't need prayer. I want you to try it next time if you're married. <laughs> you and your wife have a little struggle. Pray for her. See if anything changes. Or pray for your husband. Nothing changes. Because the need at that point is, you don't need no prayer. There's something else you didn't do. In other words, you cannot substitute one need for another need. <laughs> I feel like laughing because it's so funny. People do it all the time. <laughs> for example, you... you you and your spouse got a problem and then you buy her a gift. She don't want no gift. You didn't solve the problem. The need wasn't met. So buying something does not substitute. It's like saying, okay, my car is out of gasoline. So since I like orange juice, <laughs> orange juice is not bad. It's good. It has vitamin C, <laughs> vitamin A, it's good. But that's not what the car needs. You can't substitute. Is this good? You're all thinking. I guess you think it's ooh. <laughs> so therefore, when somebody meets you and they want to marry you, your first question is not, do you love me? <laughs> the first question should be, do you know what I need? That's a tough question. Do you know the needs of a woman? Do you know the needs of a man? And if you don't, don't marry yet. Because you're going to be substituting all the way through. And when you put gasoline tanks filled with orange juice, no matter how you turn that car, it malfunctions. Sincerity does not make orange juice work. Come on, get it? I'm sincere, baby. Yeah, but that's not what I need. Is this making sense? All right. So we need to appreciate that. Now, this, this last point, a need is a requirement necessary for effective function. That leads then to the, this fourth point, and that is every created thing was designed with inherent needs. Everything, everything. Inherent means that you do not decide the needs of a thing. So when you talk about relationships, and you talk about male and female, and that's what we're talking about here, and you're talking about being a leader that can function in your own home, out of your own environment, the first thing you got to understand is that you have to learn how to make your relationship work effectively so you don't have no confusion, distraction, when you get in the other 
areas of leadership. It's tough for you to stand in this pulpit and preach to these other folks about how to fix their marriage and your wife ain't speaking to you. First of all, that is hypocrisy at the highest level. You're not qualified to speak. Paul said again, if you do not manage your own home well, you cannot manage God's house. He puts them on the condition of each other. So if you don't know how to meet the needs of your own family, your own spouse, your own child, if you have problems with that, then he says, you're not qualified to go outside and try and lead anyone else. That's why I disagree with President Clinton. That point stuck with me. He said, what I do in my private life has nothing to do with my public responsibility. I disagree with him to his face. You don't deserve to be a leader. You see, let me tell you what he's saying. He is schizophrenic. What you see in public is not what is in private. Do you know what Jesus calls that? Hypocritical. By the way, the word hypocrite, you pronounce it hypocrite, is actually a good word. It's from the, the plays of Rome and Greece. During the time of Jesus, they had these plays. Matter of fact, one of the greatest sources of great plays is in Greek history. The Greeks were the ones who really developed this acting thing. Now when somebody was acting on the, on the stage in Greece, and the Romans also stole that from the, from the Greeks and they developed it. When somebody was acting, the characters that they played in those plays, they never used to like, like uh, be a person, you know, the real person. When they had a character, they would make a mask to represent the character. And the person will have this mask on a stick. And when they come on stage, they walk behind the mask, you see? That mask was, was called hypocrite. It means actor. The person behind the mask was not the mask. The mask was showing a different person. So where hypocrite comes from. It means behind the mask. <laughs> that's why God hates hypocrites because they're showing one face but there's someone else behind the mask and that's what Clinton was saying what you see in public is not what I am in private so just trust what I show you in public the rest is none of your business in other words leadership to most leaders is not something they are it is something they do that's not leadership that's performance that's why they call them artists it's an art it's a performance we cannot afford that in this kingdom So we need to learn how to focus on getting these homes strengthened. Let's talk about the power of needs. Write this down very quickly. Needs control and motivate behavior. That's number one. Number two, needs determine fulfillment. And number three, needs are the source of frustration and unfulfillment. And number four, when needs are not met, certain creatures malfunction. <laughs> number five, when needs are met, creation functions. Number six, the key to life then is meeting needs. And number seven, marriage is designed to meet the needs of another. And so you see how it builds. If you learn the fundamental principles, then the big complicated stuff becomes easy. It's no mystery. You have a seed, and the seed has a tree in it. You want to get the seed to produce a tree? No problem. Meet its needs. What's the seed need? Water, soil, sunlight. So you put it in the soil where there's sun, and you put water. And then the seed functions. 
you meet its needs, it produces. No mystery to life. Marriage is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> and if it's not, it's because the level of ignorance in your home is so high <laughs> concerning the needs of one another that you are living in a war zone all the time. You are in a malfunctioning environment constantly. Always angry, always on edge, always frustrated, always touchy, always afraid to talk to each other. Why? Because you don't know what's going to happen. Because you're not meeting anyone's needs. And yours not being met either. Marriage is fun. Your fun is seeing who can meet each other's needs the fastest. That's fun. Not a chore. The problem is, if you don't know what those needs are, then you become spiritual. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. See, you kind of go off into the spiritual thing. <laughs> Let me tell you something real cool now. Listen, when you get married, don't marry no prophet. You don't want no evangelist. You don't want no apostle. You don't want no pastor, no preacher, no teacher, no prayer warrior. You want a spouse. Can I hear an amen loud? Praise God. So when I want to talk to you, I don't want you to prophesy to me. <laughs> and I didn't marry you to evangelize me. Don't preach to me. See, I want a spouse. And you got to be careful. Some of you are looking for these people to marry them. These prophets and evangelists and apostles of things. <laughs> no. All right. The key to marriage. Here's a little key I have. I can have that book on, on marriage and love. Or t yeah, or two of those. The dating one too. A dating book. Yeah, boy, I tell you, this is, this, this is good stuff here. Thank you very much. That's fine. I can't stress how much uh, uh, you might want to get this book. This is about 27 years of study, finally in a book. And uh, in this book, I have the 26 needs of a woman. <laughs> that ain't all either. That's just the ones I could figure out. <laughs> uh, I had a guy said to me one time, he says, he says, women only have two needs. I said, really? I said, what is it, man? Because I want to know. I, my parents said, tell me, man, what is it? He says, he says, the first one I don't know. <laughs> and the second one I'm still trying to figure out. <laughs> I, uh, I, there's a book in my library. So, I mean, this is a real book in my library. I, I, I bought this book in the library. This book was on, on the shelf in, in, in a Christian bookstore. And it, and it had on it everything a woman needs, wants a man to know about women. I, I bought the book, opened it, and it was blank pages. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it's a pretty good book. <laughs> so I bought it. <laughs> I wanted to keep it to remind me of the mystery of a woman. <laughs> In this book, I talk about the 22 differences between a male and a female. And when you read those 22 differences, you'll see why two males cannot live together. you'll see why two females cannot get married. Because the two creatures are so different that they cannot, that the same gender cannot meet the gender's need. It takes the opposite sex to meet it. The manufacturer made a wonderful product. So here's one of the things I talk about in this book, and that is the key to marriage. Write this down, please. 
Marriage is the collision of two histories. You got to get this in your head right now and you'll be safe. When you get married, you don't marry a person. Please remember that. You don't marry people. What do you marry? A history. So when you're walking up the aisle in your dress, and that guy standing in that suit, that ain't no man. <laughs> you're walking toward a whole history. And you don't know nothing about it. And you see her coming up the aisle in that fine white dress, hidden in that veil. That's a perfect example of your reality. Hidden. <laughs> You're not marrying a woman. What are you marrying? A uh, history. Remember that. And histories tell lies. They lie about their histories. So I always tell people, look, if you're 30 years old and you get married to someone who's 30 years old, you got married to 30 years, not a person. And on a wedding night, 60 years is in the room instantly. <laughs> That's a formula for chaos. And now you're going to spend the rest of your life studying those 30 years. And believe me, they are filled with revelations. One of the most famous statements you hear in married couples' lives is this statement. Well, I didn't know. See, what they mean is, <laughs> I just got a revelation. <laughs> I didn't know you did this. I didn't know you was like that. You have a child <laughs> in Lagos? <laughs> I am your third husband? <laughs> oh, the other one is in Zambia? Oh, okay. I didn't know you were married twice before. See, history. And now you got some dangerous history lately. AIDS, which doesn't show up until five years of incubation. So marriage is not simple. <clears throat> and here you are with a great vision. <laughs> you got this big dream, and then you marry AIDS. See, it ain't funny all of a sudden. Can't fulfill your dream. Write this down. Marriage is a blood covenant. That's true. I ain't got time to get into that. Make sure get this book on waiting and dating. <laughs> this is a very important book for everyone to read. If you're married, read this twice. Start re redating your spouse. And if you ain't married, read it four times. In this, in this book, I talk about why God hates fornication. Let's explain it. Why? Because it's, it's, it's dangerous stuff. See, fornication is, is cutting a blood covenant with somebody who ain't worthy of the covenant. Because the blood covenant is for life. Blood is the only element in your body that has death and life in it. All the death in your body is in the blood. And all the life in your body is in the blood. There's no life in the, in the organs or lungs or anything, no heart. The life is in the blood. And so is the death. All your diseases are in the blood. So death and life is in the blood. So when we talk about the blood of Jesus, we talk about the death of Jesus and the life of Jesus at the same time. Are you following me? That's why when God created a female, he locks her up. A woman comes to the earth locked up. Every female comes to the earth locked up, completely locked up. And the only way to open a woman is to spill blood. Because God never intended for that woman to have intercourse unless it was with a, 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 another person, a, a male, who was committed to life and death with her. That means to live with her until death. It's a blood covenant. That's why God hates fornication. That's why being a virgin is holy 
and godly and biblical. Not a matter of sex and, and, and all this stuff we talk about. It's a matter of understanding the value of blood. So quiet. <laughs> My first title for this book, uh, when I submitted this to the publisher, the publisher liked it. The title was Waiting, Dating, and Mating. And it was called <laughs> Waiting, Not Mating, While Dating. But we decided just to call it Waiting and Dating, because the mating is on the inside. <laughs> talk about what, what to do, not what not to do. So I want to recommend these two books to you. Very important. And then finally, marriage, and this is the big one, is the commitment to meet another person's needs for life. Now that is marriage. Marriage is what? The commitment to meet another person's needs. How long? For life. That's marriage. Now notice in that, ver in that statement it doesn't mention your needs. Very important. <laughs> Sometimes we get married because we want our needs met. Wrong motivation. The marriage is already in trouble. Hallelujah. This is a tough one, eh? Think about it. Marriage is you committing yourself to meet the other person's needs for the rest of their lives. So you have two problems here. One, you may not know what the needs are. And number two, you might not get yours met. Which means that Agape in that relationship has to be present. Because agape is a strange kind of love. Let me give you an example. Okay? Talk about marriage, and then I'm going to define agape for you. The word marriage is the word gamio. It's a Greek word from the Hebrew context, uh, the transliteration. And it actually comes from the word like we use for gem, like a precious stone. And the reason why I believe God uses that is because marriage is like a diamond. How are diamonds created? Very quickly. First of all, diamonds go through a process. They begin with a porous material, and then they go under a long time of pressure. The pressure then produces fusion. It's the fusion that produces a crystalline compound that is buried under the ground, and then it is discovered later on, and that's what diamonds are. So marriage are basically a relationship that begins with porous people, weak people. But the pressure of life on that relationship fuses the people together. And that creates fusion, which becomes a crystal. And then crystal, when it's left under pressure over time, becomes a diamond. And by the way, you may not realize this, of course some of you do, but do you know that the diamond in your ring, they say it used to be wood, became coal under the pressure, which became crystal under pressure over a long period of time, which became a diamond. All right. If I took a piece of wood and gave it to you and said, this is for $50,000, would you buy it? No. But then take that piece of wood through 300 years, 400 years, 500 years of pressure, and come back and say $50,000, would you buy it? Yeah. It's a diamond now. That's marriage. You know, when I stood on my 25th anniversary celebration with my wife, we, we got married again, as you have seen. And we had a big, you know, marriage celebration and everything. All of our old friends came back and our bridal party and everyone came back. Same bridal party. Everybody was there 25 years later. And I stood up and I said to everyone, I said, you know, now we are beginning to be married. And it wasn't funny. Because you really ain't married until you've been together 25 years. You're just, you, you just beginning to, to hit the, the stride now. 
You know how long it takes to become a diamond? What makes a wood diamond is pressure. And you see, the young people, you folks can't handle a little bit of pressure. You can't wait to divorce, get out of here, split, go back to mama. You don't understand that marriage is designed for pressure. You become more precious to each other the longer you live together. Is this good? Yeah. Uh, I want to give an example, okay? See if I can do this. Can you come here a second? You too. Since you got in the same robe. Stand right here for me a minute. I want you to face back to back. Back to back. Yeah, come. Back to back. Yeah, close. Back to back. Okay. Now, now this is what God intended for marriage to look like. Just like that. Back to back. A couple of reasons. When I attack her, she can see me. Isn't that amazing? When I attack him, he can see me. Face each other. Okay. Now, the problem is when I attack him, he can't see me. And so when he gets hit, who does he see? Her. So he blames her. <laughs> this happens. This is real. Oh, you, this is how it works. So when she gets hit the light, bam, who does she blame? Who does she see? She sees him. That's the problem with marriage. We live face to face. So our spouse becomes our enemy. And the devil keeps on punching. See? Turn back to back. According to the word of God, the only part of your body that doesn't have any armor is your back. So if you are in covenant, that's the position you hold. You protect each other's weak point. So when the devil attacks the couple, then whoever is facing the attack defends the other person. Why? Because you are there to meet their needs. And you never blame the person because you can't even see them. You blame who's coming. You put it where it belongs. Now, when the pressure hits this thing, this wonderful combination, when the pressure hits it, it keeps pressing them together until the Bible says the two shall be one. So they fuse. And when you fuse, then you confuse the devil. Because when he looks at you, he sees him. And when he looks at him, he sees her. He goes, which one? Come on, give him a big hand anyhow. He's a wise God. Fusion. Thank you very much. So marriage is really a result of many, many years of pressure. Going through them together. They drive you to each other, not from each other. You ever heard this? We grew apart. It's the most silliest statement in the world. You decided to go apart. You didn't grow apart. You, you, you develop other interests. That's your problem. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is what? Honorable. Now, you may wonder why I put this verse up here. Let me tell you why I put this verse up here. The Bible never says that the people who are married are honorable. <laughs> you got to read the Bible carefully. <laughs> God says, I don't care about you two. I care about the institution. The word honorable means what? Esteemed. Highly respected. Placed on a pedestal. He says, look, the important issue here is not you two. It is marriage that's important. In other words, we, we get this attitude that if it ain't working, I'm getting out. As if we are more important than it. You 
got leaders today. I mean, big, famous preachers leaving their spouses for the silliest reason. May God rebuke them and remove them from the scene, even by death. Amen. I'm serious about it. Why? They are causing many to fall. The Bible said they shall be beaten with more stripes because they are the leaders. Don't get quiet on me now because I'm going to think you got one of the problems. <laughs> so you better say amen, somebody. Yeah, because yeah, I'm going to start looking over the crowd. People are so quick to get out. He says marriage is honorable, not you. Here's an example I use in this book, okay? Very important to read this book. I talk about the fact that when you get, that's why, you know, this book is for you if you never want to get a divorce, waiting and dating. Because it helps you understand before you even get in how this whole thing works first. Everybody's the institution. See, according to God, marriage is an institution. It's more honorable than the people who are in it. It's like going to work every day. When you go to work every day, right, you got little problems with people who work with sometimes, don't you? They get on your nerves, they get you mad, whatever, you get upset. And uh, here you are working in an office or something, you know, maybe on a job, a construction job or something, and one of the colleagues gets you upset, get mad, okay? You get a little exchange of words or whatever. What do you do? You get mad, you go home, you come back the next morning, you don't speak to them. You don't speak to them for three or four weeks. Why? You guys had a problem. So you sit next to each other, but just don't speak. And you know, there's tension in the place, you don't speak. But what's so beautiful about this whole thing is you keep coming to work. Why? Because the business, the institution, is more important than your personal conflict. Stay with me now. So you keep coming to the institution, you keep coming to the institution. You ain't speak, but you keep coming. And then after three weeks, you meet by the water fountain. You say, Good morning, good morning. <laughs> See? And you start to speak again a little bit, right? And two weeks pass, you say, you know, uh, uh, yes, can you pass me that stapler? Yes, sure. Here. Okay? And you start communicating again. And after four or five weeks pass, you say, good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Fine. And then three weeks pass, you're in the lunchroom eating together. And you're friends again. What would have happened if you have said this? I don't like you. So I resign. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I ever heard, man. Am I right? That is dumb. <laughs> Secretary gets you mad. You resign the job? Must be crazy. No, the institution is more important than those in it. That's the way marriage is supposed to be seen. My wife and I got married. We decided there's a word we don't even discuss. It doesn't show up, and that's divorce. It's not even an issue. Prenuptial agreements are directly from Satan's files, and they were faxed to you. Press delete and turn them around and send them back to hell. <laughs> You don't go in, into marriage with an escape hatch with a private key in case anything goes wrong. You just kind of slip out. That ain't marriage. That's an arrangement. That ain't marriage. It's honorable. Not you. It is. You must learn to respect marriage so much that getting out is not an option. That's why the Bible says, he who considers marriage must be sober. <laughs> Have all of your faculties working. Because when you get in, God throws away the key. Can I hear an amen? amen. Tell you, neighbor, where was this guy 20 years ago? <laughs> marriage demands a commitment to the institution above one another. Write that down. You got to be committed to the institution 
about one another. Marriage is more important than those in it. People change, but institutions are unchanging. And that's why God says marriage is honorable. Because it doesn't change. The government cannot improve on the institution of marriage. Two males getting married does not touch God's institution. That's a, different, that's a different institution. That ain't God's institution. Separate. Needs are unique to each person. The goal of relationship is the meeting of needs. The purpose of relationships is not the meeting of your needs, but the needs of another. And when needs are of the other person is met, your needs will usually be met. And this is why the beauty of relationship is so beautiful. You know, if you put gas in your car, your car normally runs for you, right? Right. So if you meet people's needs, you normally get your needs met. But you've got to be prepared to not have your needs met. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, this stuff is so important. Please buy this tape. I'm going to say it again. Be prepared to not have your needs met and you'll be happy all your life. Go in to meet their needs. But be prepared not to have yours met and you'll be happy. Because whenever they meet them, you're shocked. Ah, thank you! Woo, I didn't expect that. Praise the Lord. See, because if, if you go in just to get yours met, you already begin with problems. The number one source of failure in marriage is expectations. Expectations. What you don't expect will never disappoint you. I repeat, what you don't expect will never disappoint you. And so the key in relationship is to go after meeting the other person's needs and not expect yours to be met. Because if they are meant, then it's a bonus. If they're not meant, it doesn't touch your love for the person. Are you with me? Give you something. True love meets the needs of the one who's loved. That's true love. Because true love has no reason. Say that with me. Oh, I tell you, this is so critical. Mm, 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 mm. True love has no reason. And this is why most of us have problems in relationships, because we find reasons to loving people, including our spouse. Statement that we know well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, the Bible never, ever told us from Genesis to Revelation why God loves us. It doesn't exist in the Bible. God never gave a reason why he loved us in this book. Never, ever. I was trying to find it for years. It doesn't exist. Because if he ever gave us a reason for loving us, it's no longer love. It's a condition. <laughs> True love has no reason. Say it. That means if anyone can tell you why they love you, you are in trouble. Immediately. Instantly. Here's why. Because when you have a reason, you have a condition. When you have a condition, you have an expectation. An expectation will produce disappointments all the time. Disappointments produce division. And division will always produce that crazy word we hate, divorce. And divorce also produces a death of relationship, which also produces dysfunctional families. And that produces a social decay in society, which also produces community destruction, which also produces a national loss. In other words, your private decision becomes a national problem. All the kids in our cities, products of broken homes, so they get married and they can't get their marriage to work because they don't have a model in their own homes. Do you know that that the percentage of people who are divorced is equal in both the world and the church? Same figures. <laughs> that means getting saved don't save your marriage. Marrying a born again person is no guarantee for success in marriage. Can I get even worse? Having the Holy Ghost don't guarantee professional successful marriage. Can I tell you why? Because the Holy Spirit does not give you information. Say 
Jesus said when he comes, he will bring to your remembrance the things you learned. So if you didn't learn nothing, he can remind you of it every time you got a problem. He say, okay, here's what I want you to do, nothing. Because you didn't learn nothing. So he brings to remembrance nothing. And you keep spiraling down into destruction. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Holy Spirit cannot teach you what you didn't learn. You know, when I say things like, read this book, right? Read this book. You think I'm trying to sell books. Listen, this is research. 30 years. I'm saving you 30 years of trouble. The beauty of this is you don't need to remember the material. Just get it in. His job is to keep on bringing it every time you need it. Is that clear? The knowledge becomes a storage. The Holy Ghost is the one who pulls it up whenever you need it. People think I'm wise, no? I just got a lot of information on the inside. And no matter, no matter where I am, any second, any minute, any day, he brings in my mouth and my mind things I remembered, I read, I studied, I heard on a tape, a CD somewhere. It comes back. The moment I need it, it comes back. It's there. You don't need a good memory if you have the Holy Spirit. His job is to bring to your remembrance the things you've learned. So, that's how dangerous relationships are. All right, let me just close with something here. I don't want to talk about that. I guess I'm close with this list. Write this down, please. It's just five of them I'll give you. Uh, <laughs> uh, then the, the basic needs of a male and female. The number one need of a male is sexual fulfillment. Male needs sex. They don't want sex, they need sex, all right? Women don't need sex, they need affection. Women like sex, but they don't necessarily need it. They need what? Affection. So a woman doesn't want affection. She needs affection. Okay, so it's, it's, it's important for you to understand that. Okay, the th second need that they've identified of a, of a male is that he needs what? Huh? He needs what? Say it loud. He needs recreational companionship. In other words, the male, because of the way God designed him, let me tell you why. This, uh, in this book, I talk about how, why God did these things. I explain scripturally, too, why these needs are there. Why does a male need recreational companionship? Because a male is designed by God to be a protector. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, rather. Yeah, verse 15. God the garden. So the male is the, is the protector, the God. God designed him, therefore, to be very, uh, I'm going to use another term. The male is designed to be very possessive because he is built to protect territory. So he likes to possess things. That's why a man likes to possess even as a woman. No, this is my wife. This is my woman. This is my. See, a man is built that way. This is my house. This is my, my. A man got the spirit of possession. That's not negative. That's good. That's a, des that's a design for protection. That produces in the male the spirit of competition because he likes to protect his territory. So the spirit of competition, competitiveness is very high in the male. That's why males like sports because it appeals to their nature of protectionism. Matter of fact, when, when a man's team win, he thinks he won. <laughs> Am I right? And he goes on saying, you know, hey, we, we won last night, man. We won. He didn't play anything. We won, you know, because it's the spirit of we own a territory. See? Very important. And so the male has built into him this spirit of competitiveness. That's why, you know, this is interesting. When a, when a man commits adultery, a woman, she feels guilty and she feels abused a trust when a woman commits adultery it's different for a man a man feels violated there's a difference and this can understand how this works that's why a man would basically go to the point where you want to kill a woman see a woman wouldn't normally you know go to extremely normally would kill a man for committing adultery but a man has a tendency to almost want to kill the man and the woman 
because his territory. Keep in mind now, you see, the woman is his property in his mind. So his reaction is different. He, 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 he reacts in terms of, you took away my property. I lost my property. And so his reaction is different. He becomes violent even. A woman becomes depressed. She becomes guilty. She feels guilty. She feels abandoned. She feels hurt. But a man doesn't. He feels violated. Same act, but different response. Because they're different. Some of you wonder why there's so much domestic abuse where the male is hurting his wife. Because he needs help. He needs to come to the seminar <laughs> to understand how to manage his aggressiveness. It's not to hurt the woman, but to protect her. But he doesn't know that, so he uses it to hurt. So a man needs a woman to enjoy his competitiveness. He wants a, a, a spouse who will enjoy his stupid games. And that sounds crazy, doesn't it? I'm giving you some wisdom here. You better listen. Study what your husband likes and learn to do it with him. You hear that? You hear that? That's an honest one. The rest of them are quiet. <laughs> Look at the woman's number two need. They're different. What is it? Conversation. A woman needs conversation. She needs to be talked to, or more importantly, listened to. She needs conversation. A woman doesn't want conversation. She what? Needs it. Because God designed a woman to be stimulated by what she hears. So she likes to, that's why women talk so much. They want to hear people talk. She needs it. So if you're married to a woman, you got to have, you know, the knowledge to know, you know, she, she needs you to be together with her and then talk about things listen to each other. And a lot of times, you know, my wife has some talk, but I just listen. Because sometimes women don't want you to solve a problem, you know. And women say, I got this problem. Honey, I got this problem. And she come get this problem. She give this whole big problem. And you go, woman, you're stupid. It's simple to solve. Just do that, sir. <laughs> do that, 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 finish. And she gets mad. He <laughs> said, but I solve it. She didn't want you to solve the problem. She wanted you to talk and listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're all right. <laughs> so when a woman approaches you with a problem, gentlemen, she don't want you to solve it. She want to talk about it. And if you never solve it, she's happy. As long as you listened and everything, you just go happy walking off. Praise the Lord. He listened to me. Hallelujah. <laughs> she needs conversation. Third need of a man is what? An attractive wife. Now, here's a reason why again. The male is designed to be stimulated by what he sees. A woman designed by what she hears. Two different creatures. That's why men are stimulated by sight. Women are stimulated by sound. God designed them differently. So a man likes to have a woman that pleases him all the time. If you study Jesus, his wife, she has beautiful, he's a beautiful wife. Her wife, her name is Ecclesia, beautiful lady. And the Bible says, husbands, love your wife like Christ loves his wife. And it tells us how. It says, he washes her with the water of the word. And he cleanses her. He removes every spot, every wrinkle, every blemish. He makes her beautiful, radiant. And then he presents her to himself. That's important. He wants to look at her all the time. So ladies, your husband will need a beautiful wife all his life. If you put on 10 pounds, make them beautiful pounds. <laughs> All the men say, right on, brother. Yeah, man. My wife does a teaching, you know, in women's conferences. You should get that teaching someday. She talks about, you know, how to keep yourself chaseable. But the Bible says a man should should, uh, should, what's the word use? A man should cling. Yeah. yeah, that word cling means to chase after. Genesis chapter 2. For this cause should a man his mother father and cling. Cleave. It means to chase. 
which means that you should, it didn't say chase your sweetheart or your girlfriend. It said chase your wife. That means you're already married. That means you're supposed to look better after you get married. Make him chase you around the house. Well, we got some ladies who look pretty until you get married. I got him now. Everything falls out. <laughs> guy wake up in the morning, she go, you go, ah! Whew, is that what I married? She took off all of her faces. A man should not come home to a woman smelling like grease with some foo in her hand standing at the door saying, come on in, baby. <laughs> Rollers in her hair, slippers, you know, flannel nightdress on at two o'clock in the afternoon. However, gentlemen, the woman needs a different. She needs honesty and openness. She doesn't want that. She needs it. A woman needs a man who will tell her everything all the time, constantly telling her everything he's doing, what he's thinking. Tell him, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Here's what I'm planning to do. Always honest, open. Honest, open. Honest, open. Honestly. Very important. You shouldn't make any business plan without talking to your wife first. Don't invest the money until you let your wife know. Here's what I'm thinking of doing. What do you think about this, baby? And many times, you know, your wife will agree with you, but she want to know first. She needs to be honest and open. It's a need. All the women say amen. amen. The fourth need of a man is domestic support. This means that a man's home should become his refuge, a safe haven. Most men are afraid to go home. Why? What are you doing? How are you been? You're too late. What are you doing? Why is he? You smell it. Oh, I'm getting out of here. He's going. <laughs> He catch hell at work and catch hell at home. So he goes to the bar room. Safe. With his friends who lie to him. While he drinks his beer in the pub. The home should be a domestic pleasure for a male. He needs that. He doesn't want that. He needs it. He needs to go to a safe place. A place that is clean. Tidy. Orderly. But the children don't become a riot because he's had a hard day. It's amazing. A male needs that. However, gentlemen, a woman's need is a little different. She needs financial support. <laughs> I close it in two minutes, all right? She needs what? Come on, let's say plenty financial support. Say it. Plenty. You heard that, brothers? They say plenty. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Let me just say, for the sake of those who are thinking, but what if she's working? She still needs plenty. And I just support her. <laughs> Deep down inside of every woman, I am certain she doesn't want to have to work. I'm preaching it, baby. I'm preaching it. In a, male, in a female, it's not there. She doesn't mind working. She doesn't really want to have to go to work. She's designed just to be supported. Women are receivers. Check them out. They're built to receive. Men are givers. We're built to give. See? There's no place to receive. Look. No place to receive. That's an exit, so in case you get confused. Y'all are slow, man. I tell you, I tell you, you're slow. It's slow in England here. Yeah. I'm working on you, though. I'm working on you. You're okay. It's illegal to enter an exit. Did you know that? It's illegal. That's why the alarm goes on. Beep, beep, beep. Wrong way, wrong way. Yes, okay. <laughs> you okay, Pastor? <laughs> uh, 
So a female is built by God to receive. So she wants everything she sees, every time she sees it, no matter how much it costs. That's why you need to manage her very carefully. <laughs> Say, yeah, baby, yes, we, yeah, we can get that after 30 years of saving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the last need of a male is what? Admiration and respect. I know it's a tough one because most men doesn't seem to be qualified for it. But let me say this to you. <laughs> let me just say this. This is very important. This is not something he wants. What is it? Okay. Let me ask you a question. Does your car qualify for gasoline? No. It doesn't. But if you don't give it gasoline, it shuts down on you. These are not wants, okay? Does a plant deserve soil? No. It needs it. Look at the first one for women. What is it? Affection. What's the last one for man? See, they're on, they're on opposite ends. Admiration is not affection. It's praise. See, a male is designed to be responsible for the family. So what he needs is encouragement. Normally what he gets is criticism. And that drives him further away from responsibility. The best thing to do is to find out all the good you could about the man in your life. Whether it's a father who's an alcoholic, but at least he comes home. See, and you can say, Dad, thank you for coming home every day. You're useless when you come, but thanks, you come. You know, you come. Some men don't come home. You understand? Find something positive. Admire, praise, encourage. A male. A male needs that. Why do you think males like to be with other males? Because other males lie to them. Hey, man, you all right with me, man? Yes, sir, you my man. Yes, sir. See, they like to hit a head and stay in the group, see? Because the brother's lying to them. Hey, that's a fine suit. It's the ugliest tie I ever seen. Yeah. But brother, that's a fine. Yes, sir, you got it together. See? So he stays with those guys because they praise him. Then he goes with his wife. Where you been? You smell bad. Go bathe. You know, and the guy's going, I'm going to go back to my brothers. You understand? It's a problem, see? Why do you think most of the gangs have boys in it? Young men. Because those gangs praise them. They praise him. My prayer is that you will take lessons from this. Last need of a woman. Family commitment. That means she needs to know that you are committed only to her family. To her as the family and the kids. Boy, this is a tough one, brothers. See, a woman is designed to be built on security because she's an emotional creature. She needs security. She needs to feel secure. And if you're going to be a leader, you've got to remember that these needs are critical in your home. And you got to know each other and study these needs. Now, there are, 20, there are 22 of them, differences. you got to study them, okay? And I won't give you any more, but get, get, get the two books, and that'll help you. It is my prayer that you will not allow the word of God to fall on deaf ear tonight. Did you learn something tonight? Yes, All right. Now, let me just say this. All that I've taught you is from scripture. I, have, I don't have time to go through all the scriptures for you. So please get these two books. They're available for you tonight. And I don't know what the price of these books are. What's the price of these books? 12 pounds, is that right? 12 pounds? Okay. All right. I'll take off 4 pounds. How about that? So each book is 10 pounds each. So you get 2 for 20 pounds, okay? And I'll eat the other 2 pounds as my gift to you. But get those, because they will teach you to get all that. Oh, thank you. You like that, right? 
All right. Listen, uh, let's look at me for a second. I want to tell you something very serious. The most important thing I talked about tonight was agape love. Love that has no reason. And you cannot fulfill that kind of love without the presence of God in your life. The Bible says the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit. So you cannot live like this and have the kind of life I'm talking about that we have, my wife and I and my children, you can't, unless you have the present, dynamic, daily guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. Impossible. So you need to have a dynamic relationship with the Holy Spirit right now. And the only way to receive the Holy Spirit into your life is that you got to become holy because He is a Holy Spirit. How do you become holy? It's not difficult. Not difficult. The Bible says that we are cleansed by the blood, the death and life of Jesus. That's why he died. It was not a religious thing. It was actually a mechanical thing where God needed to, to wash us before he could live in us again. So Christ is not a martyr. He was basically a substitute. So you wouldn't have to die. So his blood was shared 2,000 years ago so God didn't have to condemn us he could forgive us and that's why it's good news he come to Jesus he takes that blood 2,000 years ago and when you say yes Lord I submit to that blood then instantly the accomplished work is applied to your life you become clean through that process he says then the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you and Nicodemus says, how do I know this will happen? He said, no man can see it when it happens. It's like the wind. But it will happen in this room tonight. If you want to live like that and have a good future and a solid relationship and get married and have a good marriage and live a long life together and then be a leader with a strong home so that your greatness is not destroyed by your defective immorality. And that's why Jesus came into the world. To make you a great person. But you need the Holy Spirit to make that possible. Watch Jesus. He, he's all right. He grew up, learned his lessons, submitted to his authority and parents. He took on a manhood responsibility. And then at age 30, he went to John because he wanted to start his assignment. He walked up to John and said, John, I got to go through my first body of water because I got to get out of this oppression. And John says, but wait a minute. He said, no, no, no. We got to do this. This is required. Everybody got to go through the first body of water. So he goes through the first body of water, and as he goes through, the Bible says the Spirit of God, like a dove, came upon him. When you go through the first body of water, you, you, you get the Spirit of God. Everybody say, saved. saved. Say, delivered. delivered. And he's delivered with the Holy Ghost out from the first body of water. And the Bible says as he came out of the water, the Spirit came upon him. And what did the Spirit do? It tells you the first thing the Spirit do was not lead him into the ministry. Come on, use your spiritual revelation here. God knew what he was doing. He says, you ain't ready for ministry yet. Because you were brought up in Palestine. You were brought up in Nazareth. You got a small mind. You were brought up in, 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 in Galilee. And so he took him to the wilderness. And he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Led by who? You mean the Spirit of God will lead you into trouble? Oh, come on, let's read Bible. Forget all of that theology you've been dealing with. God will not trust you until he tests you. Because God don't trust your mind. He saved your soul, but your mind ain't no good. And it's not as a man believe it, so is he. It's how a man think it, so is he. So God got to change your thinking so that your behavior could change. The Bible says, be ye transformed. 
by the renewing of your mind. And transform means what? Change. That means if your mind ain't changed, it still ain't changed. I don't care how you shout and dance and preach and speak in tongues. If your mind ain't changed, you still ain't transformed. And God will take you in the wilderness and everybody here has to go. Oh, hear me. I don't care who you are. God will take you through the wilderness because he won't trust you until you make it. I don't care how great your vision is, or how awesome your purpose is, or how much big things you want to do in life. God won't let you start until you go through the wilderness. Now what's in the wilderness? He says he took him there to test him. There are three tests you must pass before God trusts you with freedom. Write them down. First test is a test of appetites. you got to pass that test. you got to test... Your appetites. God will check to see if your appetites are under control. All of them. Your sexual appetites. Well, some folks want to preach with their mouths and can't keep their zip up. It's so sad today. We got men and women of God. Rushing into the ministry, can't wait to start a church, and they haven't put their loins under control yet. That's why there's such disgrace in the church. We got anointed heads with unanointed loins. Oh, come on, clap your hands, somebody. You understand what I'm talking about? We need to be changed. Our minds need to change. God will test your appetites for food, for control of your appetite. And that's the first test Jesus had to pass. Appetites under control. And he passed it. The second test you must pass, you're going to like this one, is the test for power. God will test you to see if you want power. Going after power and control. A lot of people are in the ministry for the wrong reason. Some folks want to carry the pastor's Bible for the wrong reason. Oh yeah, I know they're there. Yeah, you got folks who will do anything to get in a little position. God will test you. Brother, when you don't want the position, God will give it to you. Right where you are, work hard. Do the best you can. Don't look for promotion. It'll come from the Lord. The devil says to Jesus, come on this pinnacle and jump down. And you'll make yourself famous. You see, if you're still looking for fame, you ain't got the right spirit. Some folks rush into the ministry because of the big break. Lord help us. We got some talented people here. I mean, you could sing, you could play piano, you could play a saxophone or something. And here comes a guy who heard you play, and he says, look, I, 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 I want to put you in the studio, man. You're pretty good. Yeah. And you say, yeah. Yeah, this, this, this is your big break. Yeah, my big break. Yeah. Now listen, uh, we don't want you to mention Jesus when you sing, though. Now we'll give you $200,000, we'll pay for everything for you, but just don't mention Jesus, okay? This is your big break. We'll promote you in the secular market. We'll put you on MTV. We'll fix you. You just remember, don't mention Jesus, and everything's going to be all right. Time for your big break now. Then you got the other side. You even got some great men of God, women of God, who would come to a young uh, whippersnapper and say, hey, man, you preach good. I want you to come over to my church and take over the youth department. You even ain't sure he's saved, saved, saved. Man, I, I just like the way you preach. Yeah, anybody can have a gift but don't have character. We got some men and women in the ministry who were called into the ministry by ministers instead of God. This stuff got to stop now. Nothing in the world is worse than artificial growth. Come on, somebody. Uh, artificial growth. They take those hormones and put in those chicken eggs 
Chickens grow overnight, full of hormones, fat and plump, and make you sick and get cancer. And we got some saints like that. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, they come. Didn't have a chance to be tested or tried or go through any tribulation. And all of a sudden, they put a sign over a door front saying, they got a church. Brother, you got to run your home first. Pass to your children first. Pass to your wife first. Pass to your neighborhood first. Then try and pass to the neighborhood. There are people in the ministry who need to go out of the ministry now. Go and start over again and help someone to father you before you try and father people. God will test you for power. People are hungry for power. And the third test God tested Jesus for, He can test you for it too. It's the test of pride. Oh, that's a serious, subtle one. So if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the glory and the splendor and all the authority and influence of this city. I'll give you all this you see. If you just worship me, and you can be in the pride of life. And you will be somebody. And I'll make you important. Boy, what a tempting thing. And that's in the church. May God forgive us. But God will take you through the wilderness before He brings you into freedom. And can I suggest that when you pass the test in the wilderness, He will take you across Jordan. But according to our text in Scripture, you notice that God did not take them. Because for 40 years He tried to change their minds. Let me tell you something. Slavery is a dangerous thing. Oppression is an awesome thing. You could be a depression for 40 years and still be smelling onions and garlic. These people were strange. They cried out for freedom, cried out for deliverance, and when it came, they complained about it. Why? Because they didn't understand that freedom and responsibility go together. Now I'm going to squeeze this in one capsule. When they came out of Egypt, they went to the wilderness, and in the wilderness, the miracles were free. Free provisions, free sponsorship, free food, free clothes, free help. You know, when you first get delivered, everything is free. I'm going to tell you something now, you've got to hear this. When everybody is delivered first, life is wonderful. When you first got saved, and you got delivered from sin, you remember how you used to live? You used to pray for toothpaste and showed up in the morning. I mean, you just believe in something and it came. You remember that? I mean, you just want to get some money, someone gave it to you. You pray, young Christian, God will just bless you. He'll give you manna, He'll give you water from the rock, He'll give you clothes, He'll give you shoes, He'll be free. But there comes a time when God says, that's enough. God will feed you and clothe you and quench your thirst and He'll do it free in spite of your behavior. In deliverance. In deliverance, God will wink at your misbehavior. He will literally turn his eyes away from your disappointments. He will actually feed you even though you grumble. He clothes you even though you murmur. Because in that period, he knows you're still thinking like Egypt. But there comes a time when God says, that's enough. You've been out long enough. And do you know, if you are never willing to change and cross the river, God will bury you in the wilderness. I want you to turn to a passage of scripture real quick, Joshua chapter 5. To me, I believe this is where the church is at right now, if you want to know the season it is. This is where it's at. It's right here in chapter 5, I believe in my spirit, I sense this everywhere I travel. And it's here. It says, verse 2, at that time the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives, circumcise the Israelites, so that Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites. Now this is why he did. All those who came to, out of Egypt, all the men of military age died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out of Egypt had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert had not been circumcised. Verse 6, the Israelites had moved about in the desert for how long? 40 years, until the men who were of military age had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land for milk and honey. Everyone say milk and honey. 
He raised up their sons in their place. Everybody is a race of their children. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained there to be healed. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Just pause for a minute, I'm going to tell you something. God made sure that everyone who couldn't change their minds stayed in the wilderness and died. But God will keep a person alive who he knows can't change. He'll keep them alive so he can get what's in their loins. Are you listening to me? So some folks are alive and the thing God's with them, but he ain't with them. He's just waiting to get the children out of them. God kept these people alive for 40 years because there was a generation inside of them that he wanted to take to the promised land. And there are people who ain't going in, but they ain't dead yet. God's just waiting for their children. And when God gets your children all set, He's going to bury you. That's why the old generation, some of them are having difficulty. Because they see the new generation coming up and some of them don't want to let go. You know, it's okay to be a player on the field. But when your age and your time and the season is gone, you should become a coach. Nothing in the world is is worse than having a coach trying to play. An old one. God waited until the children were born and grown up until they had prayed to the kids and then He made sure they were buried in the wilderness. He took the children in. Secondly, you notice here, God didn't allow them to be circumcised in the wilderness. Why? He didn't want any thing from the wilderness to be in their bodies or a mark on them when they enter the freedom. It's very important. And then he tells them why in verse 9. He says, I did this to take away the reproach of Egypt. Reproach means shame. God wants you to forget your slavery. He wants to cut it off. He wants to say, I want to lift the sting of it, the, the memory of it. I want to take it from you. The reproach has to be taken off. Some folks are in deliverance and still feeling like slavery. And God has to cut you off. He'll have to circumcise your heart all over again. He has to change the way you think to get you out of that mentality. Now I'm going to read a verse that I think is the key. The evening of the 14th day, they are now in the promised land. The day after the Passover, verse 11, they ate some of the manna, or some of the produce of the land of freedom. They are in Canaan now, and they're eating. And after the first meal, underline this verse, the Bible says, the manna stopped. Lord have mercy. I believe that's where we are right now. God is saying, I appreciate all of your claiming and naming. All your bless me and bless me that and bless me that. He said, them days over now. I want a people who ain't going to be looking for manna no more, but looking for management. God cuts the manner off when you grow up. He's now making them responsible for, for providing their own food, their own clothes. Their clothes wore out in Canaan. The manna stopped in Canaan. The water never came from the rock in Canaan. And when they got in Canaan, did they fight? Who did they fight? Brother, freedom means fighting time. Freedom means you got to dig your own wells. Help me, Lord. You got to plant your own corn. You got to sow your own clothes. You got to develop your own strategies. And I like what God says to Joshua. God says, Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, He says, I'll be with you as I was with Moses. But I tell you, friends, if you look at the way God was with Joshua, it's not the same way He was with Moses. And sometimes believe God is not with you because he ain't working the way he used to work with the old fellas. Come on now, let's talk with this. We've got to talk about this. People say, well, you know, well, it, the way it used to be, it ain't like that no more. God is so wise. God made sure that Moses didn't go. Because he knew that Joshua would be in charge. And friends, 
I asked the Lord a few months ago, what would have happened if Moses went into the land of Joshua? Friends, we have a problem today. Because Moses knew how God worked with him. And God did nothing with Joshua the way he did it with Moses, even though he was with Joshua. Moses stretched the rod over the sea, and the water opened. God told Joshua, you can walk in yours. All the enemies in the wilderness, God fought for them. But when they came to Canaan, God says, hey man, pick up a sword. With Moses, I work for him. But with you, I'm going to work with you. Come on, somebody. Some of you are still wanting God to do everything for you. Nuh-uh. -uh. God has created you to be a responsible person. And he wants to teach you responsibility. And it's time for you to read the Bible for yourself. Don't let no TV evangelist make you read the Bible anymore. You got to pray for yourself. You don't need no traveling prayer minister to teach you how to pray no more. Pray by yourself now. Responsibility time. Don't let no one come and try to pump you and make you give and talk about giving and talk about blessing. Don't give because you're going to get blessed. Give because you love Him. Be responsible. God wants people who are responsible people now. He wants people who are going to do it because they know it's right. The manna dried up, and it never came back. And so, I got some news for you. There's no greater burden than freedom. There's no heavier load than liberty. The security of slavery is the absence of responsibility. Let me try it just one more time. The security of slavery is the absence of responsibility. In other words, people like slavery because in slavery you don't have to be responsible. The comfort of oppression is the absence of self-determination. The attraction of subjugation is the privilege of blame. When you are subjugated, when you are oppressed, you can always blame your oppressor. But when you're free, you can't blame nobody. More men in this building and women are afraid of freedom than of slavery. Because freedom is frightening. The cry of freedom usually ends in the murmur of regret. The child demands freedom from his parents. The spouse demands freedom from his partner. The slave demands freedom from the master. The colony demands freedom from its imperial oppressor. The youth demands freedom from laws and prohibitions. And the subjects demand freedom from their dictators. And what happens? What do we mean when we say freedom? The general perception and the concept of freedom is this. Freedom is the absence of laws and restrictions, we think. Or freedom is the void of work and obligation. Freedom is retirement from responsibility. Freedom is the right to do as one pleases. Freedom is eternal relaxation. Freedom is the release from eternal con external control. However, all of these concepts of freedom are erroneous and dangerously embraced by the significant segment of our society. The truth is, freedom imposes more laws on you than slavery. Freedom demands more work than slavery. Freedom requires more responsibility than slavery. Freedom demands that you do the right thing. Freedom imposes more the need for internal control than external control. In other words, in freedom, you need more control than in slavery. Unconsciously, slavery, oppression, and subjugation is more attractive than freedom. Because the demands of freedom are higher than slavery. We escape from freedom when we seek to avoid responsibility for our own behavior. Any misconception of freedom will always result in bondage. And many confuse freedom with independence. Some mistake freedom for permission. And others consider freedom lack of accountability. But freedom is an interesting word. 
It means liberty. It's the Hebrew word, apshach, or hapshach. And it means liberty. It also is the Greek word proletia, which means citizen. Freedom is an attribute of God. The Bible says he worked all things after the counsel of his will. By this, God expresses the truth that God himself is self-determining as an agent. He's a free personal being acting purely in accordance with his own perfections. God, he shows that he is the reason and the purpose of all his creation is for them to exercise the divine act of freedom just like he exercises it. The Bible says he created all things by and for and through him. Freedom for us as men in the image of God is the power of the mind and the will to choose between alternatives. The power to choose between God and the devil, good and evil. Thus man freely determines his own future and destiny as he chooses between what life has to offer. Man was created in the image of God and accordingly was endowed with perfect moral freedom. Sin results from abuse of that freedom which resulted in man being in a state of complete moral inability. Romans 7, 19 tells us how man became a victim of his own abuse. And though he still possesses natural freedom, man is in prison spiritually. Freedom is essential to all moral responsibility. And moral responsibility is one of the institutions of the human mind. The root meaning of freedom, that's what I want to write this up on. Write the word freedom down. The word freedom is made up of two words, free and dom, from the word dominion or domain. Freedom, therefore, means the liberty to dominate or the right to rule your environment, not to rule other people. Freedom is the liberty or right to dominate, govern, and manage your environment. That's what God gave Adam. Genesis says, let them have dominion. And that's God's release of freedom. Freedom is the delegated release of authority to be responsible for governing and to managing your designated sphere of influence. Freedom, therefore, makes you responsible and accountable. God delegated freedom, the right for every man to dominate and govern rule the earth. Therefore, freedom is always within the law of delegation. There is no freedom without law. And therefore, freedom is always under law. Freedom means you're not under control of any other person, but under the higher law of principle laid down by God. Freedom is not the absence of work or the cancellation of responsibility, but rather the release of work and the release to work and to fulfill the assignment of responsibility. Jesus closes the concept of freedom with a statement. John 8.32, he says, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In other words, freedom can't be given to you by a human being. It's discovered when you discover truth about you and about life. A slave has no permanent place in the family, Jesus said in John 15, but a son belongs to the family forever. Servants, he says, must be promoted to friends. God does not want us to remain as servants always begging and following and crawling. He wants us to become friends who know his mind and his will and his purpose. Paul speaks in Galatians 4 and he says, As long as the heir is a child, he is treated like a slave. But when he is grown up, he gets the inheritance. How long are we going to be treated like a slave in the body of Christ? Irresponsibility leads to slavery. Proverbs 6, 5 says, Free yourself like a gazelle, you slug it, and get up from your sleep. A little sleep, a little slumber, and poverty comes upon you like a bandit. Freedom demands responsibility. And responsibility is the result of maturity, which is the evidence of character, which is produced by trials and tests. Disobedience leads to bondage, and obedience leads to responsibility. Freedom is expensive, and it costs a high price. Deliverance is instant, but freedom is a process. 
One must be prepared for freedom. All oppression produces the spirit of irresponsibility, the spirit of laziness, hatred for work, fear, distrust, low self-esteem, poor self-concept, selfishness, timidity, and a spirit of immediate gratification. And that's what we're suffering from right now. People who have been oppressed for many years, they want instant gratification. They don't want to plan and wait and earn. They want instant cash now. It's a spirit of slavery still upon them. Esau was a good example of a man who has a slave mentality. When he's hungry, he'll sell his birthright for some food instantly, forgetting that he'll be hungry again. Deliverance may not lead to freedom, and that's the sadness of this night. Deliverance is not freedom. Freedom is deliverance from oppression. Deliverance is release from the oppressor. Let me repeat it. Deliverance is the release from the oppressor, but freedom is the deliverance from oppression. You can be delivered and still oppressed. In essence, it is possible to be delivered and still not free. The power of the oppressor is the maintenance of ignorance. And therefore, the oppressed must be set free through knowledge of the truth. Both the oppressed and the oppressor need to be delivered and set free. And the oppressed need to be delivered from oppression, and the oppressor need to be delivered from his misconception of the oppressed. I'm going to try one more time. Lord, help me on this last point. I said the oppressed need to be delivered from the oppressor. But the oppressor also need to be delivered from his misconception of the oppressed. Some of you are going to get it after I'm gone. Buy this tape. Listen to it five times. You see, a man can set you free physically and still not accept you as an equal. And that's what's going to happen in South Africa. The people have been involved. I just came from there. It's hard for those people to confuse freedom with deliverance. That's what's going to happen. And believe me, friends, when you are free, you don't need to be accepted. Therefore, the, the delivered must be trained for freedom. Most Christians are delivered spirits with oppressed minds. Sudden freedom can overwhelm a slave and drive him back into bondage. This was the failure of colonialism in my experience in our own country. They produced dependents as colonies and parasites, and when they gave us independence, we were still dependent on them. Freedom is not synonymous with independence. And that's why I'm concerned about South Africa. I'm going back there in a few weeks. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 5. Let's close on that verse, please, and we're going to go. Please turn there. I want everyone to read this. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, chapter 10, rather, verse 5. That's in the Old Testament. Be careful what you read, it's detrimental to your ignorance. It says in verse 16, Woe to the land when a slave becomes king. I'm going to repeat it. Woe to you, O land, when a slave becomes king. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 Rather, verse 16. Chapter 10, verse 16. Woe to the land when a slave becomes king. What does God say? He's saying when a man is in charge who still has an oppressed mentality, you are in trouble. If I was to say what God is wanting, and this is my prophetic word to this conference, in this era, this season right now, God is desiring that we be transformed mentally for freedom. We've been delivered, we've been dancing, we've been having a great time over the past couple of hundred years. But now we have to move into a different sphere of responsibility. And I say to this conference, Pastor Carlton, I want you to stand for a minute. 
I want to address this directly to you. The Lord spoke to my heart and told me to speak this into this conference through this leader. It's a great leader here. God says that years ago he tried to do this through a man just like you. But it didn't work. Because the man bought deliverance. But he didn't bring freedom. And God desired to keep the name because he's trying to do something that wasn't done. Those who tried to fulfill God's purpose at that time, they were smothered by others. And what was intended to happen did not happen. Hear me. And so even the man who God intended to use was forgotten for years. And others who had the spirit of oppressors took what God had desired and buried it. The Spirit of God has blown into this generation with a desire to do it one more time. The man before you died and never fulfilled what God wanted done. Because he wanted to be accepted. And so the people danced, the streets were jammed, you couldn't get near the building, but they were not free. It's doing it one more time. Azusa. The place is jammed. People trying to get in. One more time. But this time, he doesn't want deliverance only. He wants them to be free in their minds. He wants them to be renewed in their own thinking about who they are. Where they came from, why they're here, and how important everybody is. He's desiring that you not search for company. You got all the company you need, says the Lord. Look around you. That you must not search to join a status. He gave you status when he called you. He doesn't want this to be a proverb like the last one. He doesn't want others to take what he has done and make it theirs. He wants you to bring the people 